Okay, folks. Well, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Laura Ferguson. I am the Associate Director of 2765 Services for the Behavioral Health Administration. And today I am here to share with you um, about House Bill 22-1256 implementation, specifically um, what the provisions were of this bill and what providers and folks need to know moving forward. So uh, looking forward to sharing this information with you today. Before I start, I want to just share, um, oh, pardon me, mess that up a little bit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to just share a little bit about this bill. Um, until the signing of 1256 into law uh, last year in 2022, the involuntary mental health treatment statutes had not been meaningfully updated since the 1970s, believe it or not. So this was um, long overdue and uh, there is a whole lot to this bill. So um, so much has changed since the 70s, as, as we all know, for folks receiving behavioral health services and for the loved ones involved in their care. Um, there are a whole lot of changes that are have, have happened and will continue to happen with this bill, um, including an expansion of patient rights, um, expansion of who can place and remove a 72-hour hold, all sorts of different changes. Uh, these changes are going to be phased in over the next three years. <clears throat> So uh, some of the uh, provisions of this bill have already gone into effect. Some will go into effect uh, July 1st of 2023, and some will go into effect uh, July 1st of 2024. So we're going to kind of cover the highlights of the bill. I'm going to say this now as well as, at the, as well as at the end of the presentation. I highly recommend that you review the bill language itself as well as the updated 2765 statutes, uh, particularly if you are a 2765 designated provider. You're going to want to dig into this a little bit more than this uh, presentation today will offer, but this is a great overview. All right. <clears throat> so today's agenda, I want to just talk a little bit about the background of the bill, um, as well as uh, kind of go into some of the specific statutory changes that were brought by this bill and um, implications for providers, as well as the timelines for implementation. So we're going to share about that. And then I'm going to also share about what the BHA is working on in order to uh, prepare for unrolling of these new provisions. So we're going to talk about all those things today. Um, so for House Bill 22-1256, it's called Modifications to Civil Involuntary Commitment. This uh, bill, the stakeholder process began in February of 2021, and this bill was largely conceived and drafted by uh, Mental Health Colorado, um, and the Behavioral Health Administration partnered with them uh, for part of that stakeholder process and just gathered a whole lot of feedback, um, and then this bill was signed into law in 2022. It updates every single section of Title uh, 27, Article 65, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, this is huge because the statute had not been meaningfully updated since the 1970s. So this was long overdue. Um, I think the community, I think most of us uh, agree that there are still changes that need to be made, perhaps some additions in the future that will need to occur. But this is, uh, this is a great start as far as strengthening patient rights across the board for all the different involuntary treatment procedures. All right. So just a, a very basic overview of the House bill. Um, it updates and or adds patient rights of some sort to every involuntary procedure outlined in uh, 2765. So that includes the involuntary transportation hold, the emergency mental health hold, <clears throat> and short and long-term certifications, including uh, patient rights that are specific to outpatient certification. So um, this is wonderful. It means that now there are specific patient rights for each of those separate involuntary procedures, uh, which is the reason the statute exists, is to ensure that folks receive humane quality care uh, from our 2765 designated providers. Uh, this bill also updates who, what types of professionals can place a transportation hold, so we'll cover that. There are some major updates to the 72-hour hold, so we'll go over some of those. Um, there's a new statutory section that's just dedicated to outpatient certifications only, so that's brand new. 
um, new data reporting responsibilities, both for our 2765 designated facilities as well as emergency medical services facilities. And the reason is because we really need that data as a state to help inform um, our needs and our services moving forward. So that will be very helpful for us to have. <clears throat> There are a lot of new responsibilities for the Behavioral Health Administration, including hiring more staff to support the 2765 program. And um, as I mentioned, as part of this bill, there are three different implementation timelines. So we're kind of going to cover everything based on the implementation date. All right. So <clears throat> forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst of a, of a cold. So forgive my occasional coughs and sniffs. Um, so there are already some reforms in effect now. Uh, they went into effect August 9th of 2022. Um, so first and foremost, there are some new statutory sections. For example, uh, section 2765-105 is our current emergency procedure. So that, that currently outlines uh, the procedure for um, uh, placing somebody uh, on an emergency mental health hold, but effective, um, <clears throat> forgive me, uh, no, I'm sorry, I messed up with that. Um, no, so the new statutory section for the emergency procedure is actually 2765-106. My apologies. So those statutory, statutory sections have already changed. So again, I would just encourage you, if you work with the statutes a lot, to go into uh, the 2765 statute and just re-familiarize yourself with the sections and with what provisions are in each section because those have changed around a little bit. All right. Uh, there are now new intervening professionals who can place an emergency mental health hold. We have now added physician's assistants as well as advanced practice nurses. So that is fantastic. Uh, those are very important members of the behavioral health community. Uh, so those folks may now uh, statutorily place an emergency mental health hold. Uh, there are already significant changes in effect uh, for the transportation hold. Um, there are now patient rights that are specifically attached to the transportation hold. So those are rights that are to be provided to individuals prior to being transported to a facility uh, to determine whether they then meet criteria for an emergency mental health hold. Um, uh, Mental health clinicians, such as licensed clinical social workers or LPCs or LMFTs like myself, we are no longer eligible to place <clears throat> involuntary transportation holds. And the reason is because the licensed mental health clinicians are deemed to be um, uh, knowledgeable and um, able to determine whether somebody meets that criteria for an emergency mental health hold or an M1 hold. So the uh, transportation hold is now reserved only for certified peace officers as well as for EMS professionals. And so this is all new to EMS professionals. They have never been part of the involuntary treatment process in Colorado before. So um, we are working on putting together some training for EMS folks, um, which I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, the other pieces I want to mention on this slide is uh, all folks who are certified now will have the right to an attorney. <clears throat> and so the court will automatically appoint an attorney for folks who are on short term or long term certifications. And those respondents may only waive counsel in front of a judge. So um, this just adds additional protection for folks who are being treated um, under our 2765 system. Um, another provision that's already in effect is that the BHA must be notified by our 2765 designated providers whenever somebody's certification is terminated or expires. So um, there is already a process in place on the BHA website and emails have gone out to all our designated providers to let them know how they can notify the BHA whenever somebody's uh, uh, certification is being terminated. And again, this information um, the BHA has not had access to before and so this will really help to um, the state to determine uh, needs and um, training needs and treatment needs and, you know, all those things moving forward um, based on folks' uh, certification data. So that will be very valuable for us to have as a state. Additionally, um, if a uh, certification is being transferred from one designated facility to another, um, the designated facility must ensure that 
medical records are transferred to um, the other facility at least 24 hours prior to the person being uh, transferred to the, to the new facility. So that's another provision that's already in place. All right. Um, so effective July 1st, 2023, there are a few slides on this and I, I recognize these are very wordy. This is all, this is how I could get this onto the presentation. Uh, there's a lot that goes into effect July 1st and the majority of these provisions are going to be 72 hour hold reforms. Um, so first things first, uh, we are no longer going to call this a 72 hour treatment and evaluation or emergency procedure. So we are now effective July 1st going to call this an emergency mental health hold. Uh, emergency mental health holds will continue to be established utilizing the uh, BHA created M1 form. We are updating those forms as well. So more about that later. Um, but essentially uh, effective July 1st, we'll be calling this an emergency mental health hold. <clears throat> Um, some other provisions on this slide, I'm not going to cover, you know, read everything, but I'm going to just kind of go over highlights. Um, law enforcement, as of July 1st, will have the discretion to ignore a warrant and to take folks directly to a treatment facility or an emergency medical services facility if that law enforcement officer believes it's in the best interest of the person. So this is an effort to make sure that folks who are in dire need of uh, emergency mental health treatment do not end up in jails, uh, but that they're receiving a treatment in an appropriate facility um, where they belong. So that's that's an important provision effective July 1st. Um, additionally, um, let's see here, the person who is in charge of the initial evaluation, let's say there's a, a clinician in the emergency department who's conducting an evaluation to determine if someone <clears throat> meets criteria for an emergency mental health hold. That individual, if they determine that the crisis has passed or the person no longer meets criteria, may discontinue the hold. So uh, effective July 1st, that will be the case. Um, currently only a professional person, which is defined as a physician or a psychologist, may discontinue an emergency mental health hold. So this will be a change that hopefully will help with some workflow issues. Um, those evaluations may be completed by uh, folks who are specified on this slide, a professional person, again, that's a physician or psychologist, a psychiatric advanced practice nurse or physician's assistant, or a licensed clinician that uh, who has two years of experience in uh, behavioral health and safety assessments. So those are the folks who will be able to complete those initial evaluations. Um, let's see, some other pieces. Um, effective July 1st, all of these evaluations must be completed using a standardized form that's created and provided by the Behavioral Health Administration. We are working on developing that form now. And we are also working with some of our local emergency medical services facilities to ensure we have all the components on that form that are crucial to ensure a, a good thorough evaluation. So that will be made available on the BHA website as soon as it's ready to go. And then of course we will make updates as needed to make sure that this form works for everybody uh, since it'll be required <clears throat> to be utilized across the state. Forgive me, I'm, I'm working with a cold here, so forgive the occasional coughs. All right. Um, the other piece is that uh, certified peace officers are no longer part of the definition of an intervening professional. For those who may not know, an intervening professional is essentially um, the types of professionals who are statutorily allowed to enact an emergency mental health hold. So certified peace officers because they're not behavioral health clinicians or professionals, they've been separated from that definition. So there are now going to be two pathways for placing an M1 hold in the community. One of those pathways is specific to law enforcement, and essentially none of their processes or procedures uh, around this will change. Uh, they just are no longer called an intervening professional. And then the second pathway is specific to intervening professionals, and those are our licensed clinicians and physicians and such. So those are some uh, changes to expect effective July 1st of 2023. A couple more slides with this effective date, so we'll move on to the next one. 
All right. So um, beginning in July, if somebody has been, let's say, in an emergency department for close to 72 hours and perhaps the ED has been trying to find psychiatric placement and um, nobody has accepted this person for admission, um, the ED or emergency medical services facility will notify the BHA. <coughs> And the BHA will then support that facility in locating an appropriate placement option. Um, so uh, it's important to note that, unfortunately, this House bill did not provide the BHA with additional funding for beds. So we won't have any um, additional beds available per se as a result of this bill. However, emergency medical services facilities will at least receive the support of the BHA if they can't find placement for somebody. We, we will have someone available to assist with that process as best we can. All right, and then another gigantic change that happens this July is that if a person is in an emergency department and uh, an appropriate placement cannot be located at a designated facility, the ED can now or will now be able to place somebody on a subsequent um, emergency mental health hold if they continue to meet criteria, of course, and also if the facility does the following. So uh, if someone's placed on a second uh, emergency mental health hold, the BHA must be notified and, and we'll, we'll offer a, a contact for that prior to July 1st. Uh, the person's lay person must be notified. And typically that's the person's emergency contact or someone the individual has designated as uh, wanting, you know, wanting them to stay in the loop regarding what's happening with their involuntary treatment. And then finally, uh, the ED or emergency medical services facility must notify the court. And the court's responsibility is then to immediately appoint counsel to anyone placed on a subsequent emergency mental health hold. So that will offer those additional protections uh, for patients there. All right. Um, additionally, our 2765 designated facilities, they may also uh, place somebody on a subsequent men uh, emergency mental health hold, but they must be able to demonstrate and document in the, in the, in the client chart that uh, they did not have time to complete or to evaluate the person for a certification before that hold expires. And so that might, that might be important if, say, somebody arrives at a designated inpatient facility, you know, and their hold is at 70 hours and there's no way that the facility can get that certification in place, they will then be able to um, enact a <clears throat> subsequent emergency mental health hold until they can work on that certification. Um, again, the person's lay person as well as the BHA must be notified in those cases. Um, so those are the, the big provisions there. Um, additional provisions that are effective July 1st of 2023, um, there are specific components now that will statutorily be required to be in discharge instructions for folks. So <coughs> forgive me take a look at this list and review the statute. And I would just encourage our 2765 designated providers to make sure that these components are on uh, integrated onto your discharge instructions, uh, both in your EHR or on paper prior to July 1st, because these will need to be in, um, in all of those instructions given to folks. And a few of those pieces are um, the crisis, the Colorado crisis hotline, um, any information about psychiatric advanced directives that were either developed or initiated during services, uh, those types of things. Um, effective July 1st, uh, there must be follow-up calls for all folks placed on emergency mental health holds, and those must occur within 72 hours after discharge. Additionally, if the person is a Medicaid client, the facility must notify either the ray uh, or must notify the ray of the individual's discharge and the need for follow up. So that way, the ray knows this person was placed on a, on an emergency mental health hold, and they may need some follow up um, from the ray. All right. Uh, there are some changes to patient rights, and on this slide, um, there's an overview of what those new rights will look like, uh, so be sure to take a look at those, and those will be reflected on our updated uh, M2, which is the patient rights form that accompanies the M1 form, so be on the lookout for those soon. I want to highlight a couple of specific uh, patient rights that are new. Uh, the first is regarding uh, the individual uh, wearing their own clothes and keeping their own personal possessions. So effective July 1st, um, individuals may use their 
or use their own personal possessions and uh, wear their own clothes unless it is determined on an individual case by case basis that the person <clears throat> the person's um, clothes or personal items should be restricted for safety reasons. So this basically means that there, there, may, there can no longer be an across the board policy restricting uh, somebody's clothes or personal items, but this just needs to be determined on a case by case basis and then documented clearly in the individual's chart. So if the facility decides to restrict the person's access uh, to their items, they need to sit down and have a discussion with that person as to why those items are being restricted. And then you'll wanna make that note in the patient chart that we did sit down and have that conversation. Um, so that conversation needs to happen. And then ongoing assessments need to occur to make sure that the person receives those items back if they're able to safely possess them at some point. One caveat to this, um, and I know we get a lot of questions about this, um, you, the facility may temporarily restrict folks' access to their clothing or personal possessions initially until a safety assessment is completed. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that is completely okay to do. Want to make sure folks are safe. Um, but as soon as that initial safety assessment is completed, folks' belongings um, and clothing should be given back unless it's do been documented in the chart that they're going to be restricted for safety reasons. So hopefully that makes sense. The other um, more controversial uh, statutory addition that I want to cover is um, the use of a cell phone. So as you know, many folks uh, utilize their cell phone um, as coping skills. It's their connection to folks, to support groups, to friends, to family. Uh, some people use apps for their mental health, um, my strength, those types of things. Um, and so um, restricting individuals' cell phones across the board will no longer be allowed uh, based on the statute. So this is this is the the new law. Um, I know that's that's causing some concern for folks as far as safety issues go. Um, so I would just encourage our 2765 designated facilities to update policies and procedures now um, to allow for this and to make sure that. Um, procedures are in place for this piece. So definitely go and review the new patient rights and ask as many questions as you need to. But essentially, um, if you think about outpatient facilities and people receiving services, you know, outpatient SUD services, perhaps um, people who are, you know, receiving outpatient medical services or inpatient medical services, all of those folks um, are able to retain their personal cell phone and use that. And so this is a destigmatizing effort for individuals going through a behavioral health crisis to also have that resource at their disposal. Um, and so cell phones are going to only be, you can only remove the cell phone if it's going to cause the person to destabilize um, or if it creates a danger to themselves or others. So that needs to be something that um, occurs and then it can be documented in the patient chart and that cell phone can be restricted. Um, but it, the cell phones can't can no longer be restricted across the board for those reasons. So keep that in mind. I know there's a lot of concerns about this one and just wanna offer that there is a balance uh, with regard to um, anti-stigma and patient rights. So keeping those pieces in mind um, as you work through policies and procedures around this. All right, I am moving into July 1st, 2024 reforms. I know this is a whole lot of information, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, July 1st, 2024, there's a lot of changes coming to outpatient certifications. Um, uh, first and foremost, there needs to be a, a one-step grievance process established by the Behavioral Health Administration. We do already have a very robust grievance process in place. We are also going to be building an entire team of folks to uh, receive and investigate complaints and grievances. And we are, will be posting information on our website uh, for people receiving services and their friends and family members so that the process is very clear and folks know what to expect after they submit a grievance to the BHA. So we will be working on that absolutely to provide additional uh, accountability uh, for the behavioral health system. <clears throat> Um, effective July 1st of 2024, an individual or uh, their lay person or a guardian may contest their treatment regimen at any time, um, and this includes court-ordered medications. These uh, treatment regimens may be contested at any court hearing related to the certification, so there doesn't need to be any sort of special court hearing for this. 
Um, other changes effective 2024, um, the uh, let's see the uh, providers who are who are overseeing outpatient certifications. There's going to be some limitations on liability for those folks. I know there's been some concerns uh, from some of our mental health centers about accepting folks on certification due to liability issues. And uh, this statute uh, really remedied a lot of those concerns. There's just a couple of exceptions to that, but ultimately uh, those those outpatient certification providers will not be liable, say, if they have somebody on a certification and they disappear or they can't find them or they stop attending appointments. Um, so be sure to take a look at, at that language and um, make sure you're aware of those, those provisions. Um, there will also be, uh, as, as I mentioned, patient rights specific to outpatient certification. Um, as many of you know, the patient rights we've had to date really don't apply to folks on an outpatient certification. And so uh, this, this uh, bill changed that and now we'll have rights specific to that for folks. Um, so look for those, uh, those patient rights coming out soon um, on an M form so you can utilize those. <clears throat> Um, a big provision that is going to be in effect July 1st of 2024 is that the BHA will provide care coordination for folks on certifications. So if an individual is being um, uh, terminated from a certification, but the designated facility feels like this person could use some ongoing support or care coordination, and the BHA agrees, then the BHA will actually provide that care coordination effective 2024. So that's going to be fantastic. Um, so we're working on that process uh, as well. All right. So now I'm going to move to kind of talking about BHA implementation of this bill. We have a lot of, of projects we're working on currently to make sure that we unroll all of this successfully. Um, so this is sort of an overview, and then I, I'll kind of cover where we're at with each one of these. Um, the BHA is going to need to update all of those M forms, and those are all the forms you use to enact an emergency mental health hold, the patient rights forms, um, court court forms for establishing short-term and long-term certifications. So all of those forms are currently being updated, and we're working on that. Um, the Behavioral Health Administration is currently creating an entirely new rule volume for all of our licensed and designated providers that will take into account the provisions of this 1256 bill. Um, there uh, needs to be a process in place for notification to the Behavioral Health Administration about termination of certifications. Um, that is already in place, as I mentioned earlier. Our designated providers are aware that there is a uh, secure Google form available on our website, and they may use that form and actually must use that form to report any certifications that either are expiring or that have terminated or that they plan to terminate. So that process is already in place. <clears throat> um, we need to have a process for supporting placement of individuals effective July 1st of 2023. So that's uh, a process to assist emergency medical services facilities if someone's been on that hold for 72 hours. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we are working on a contact for that and we'll make sure that that there's a specific person at the BHA or a phone number or, or a process in place for those emergency uh, services facilities to outreach when they need that support. Um, creation of one-step grievance process is something we need to work on. Uh, we need to work on a process for the care coordination for folks on certifications. That won't be effective until 2024. And then the BHA is also tasked with providing quite a bit of training related to 2765, which I'm most excited about. So I'm just going to kind of go through these next few slides and cover where the BHA is at with each one of these uh, implementation tasks. So you know kind of what to expect there. All right. So updates to the M forms. We have received a lot of emails and, and inquiries about where these are. Um, there was a really quick turnaround time between the bill uh, being signed and um, the new provisions going into effect. So we are still working on those updates to the M forms uh, internally. Our next step is for those forms to go to the attorney general's office for review. And then as soon as, as possible, we will get those posted to the BHA website for use and we'll disseminate that information wide and far so folks know those are available. <clears throat> 
All right. Uh, the behavioral health rules uh, with the creation of behavioral health administration, which launched on July 1st, 2022. Uh, we are in the process of creating an entirely new set of behavioral health rules for all of our licensed and designated facilities. And those rules will include all of these updates from the 1256 bill. Um, the stakeholder process for the new rule draft um, has concluded, I believe, and now we are working on getting that uh, the new rules to the state board for approval. They will be in effect sometime on or before July 1st of 2023. And again, we will be sure to notify everyone everywhere as, as best we can as soon as these new rules are um, adopted and ready for uh, ready for agencies to uh, to look at. So. Uh, be on the lookout for those coming soon. All right. Um, already mentioned that all 2765 designated providers should already be submitting uh, regular notification of each and every certification termination to the BHA. This is for anybody being terminated from a short-term or long-term certification or anybody whose short or long-term certification is expiring. That Google form is available on the BHA website and it's linked right here. So our 2765 designated providers, um, <clears throat> if you are not already doing uh, submitting those to the BHA, be sure that you do that effective immediately. We, we desperately need this data in order to inform uh, treatment needs moving forward. So this will be an important component. This is also a requirement uh, for your designation moving forward. So be sure that you're, you're doing that to ensure compliance with those designation requirements. All right. Uh, next is the standardized evaluation form that uh, 1256 is requiring the BHA to develop. Uh, we are starting work on that now. Um, currently, mental health evaluations are typically conducted on an ED specific form or template. Um, I know when I worked in the EDs, I had my own template that I used. So this will be a new thing for uh, most um, emergency medical services facilities to have a BHA created uh, standardized evaluation form for use. Um, so we are going to draft that. We're working on drafting that form. It needs to be available by July 1st of this year. Um, we are hoping to um, post the form on the website at least and offer some stakeholder opportunities for feedback, uh, either live um, or perhaps via email or, or an online form submission. Uh, we really, really want to make sure that this, this uh, standardized evaluation form works for everybody across the board. So we're going to try really hard to get this right the first time. Um, but be on the lookout for that coming soon. It is possible that uh, some of you may not be able to add this standardized evaluation form to your electronic health record system um, by July 1st. I know sometimes uh, those EHR updates can take many months. So it is possible you'd have to use a paper version of this or, or, um, or uh, utilize the BHA version and then scan it into the treatment record, that type of thing. But we're working on getting this done as quickly as we possibly can. Again, the turnaround time was just pretty short. So that's where uh, that's the status of that standardized evaluation form. All right. And then um, July 2023, I think I mentioned that uh, the BHA will be supporting emergency medical services facilities in locating placement for um, for folks uh, when no appropriate beds can be found. And so uh, just know that we're working on a process for that. There will likely be a dedicated phone number um, to call uh, for emergency medical services facilities to call and they'll reach somebody from the BHA who can, assess, who can assist with that process. So as soon as we have that information, we will be sure to post that on our website and uh, get that information out there. All right. Already mentioned that the BHA has a, a pretty great um, grievance and complaint process already. Um, we look into each and every complaint if if it, if it's if it falls within our purview, or sometimes if someone submits a complaint uh, that it would be outside of the BHA's purview, we will work to connect them with the appropriate <clears throat> state resource or entity so that they can have their voice heard and, and submit their complaint to the appropriate entity. So, um, but effective uh, July 1st of 2024, uh, we will have a team of folks in place at the BHA devoted specifically to receiving complaints and investigating those. Um, we'll also have information on our website for, for uh, folks receiving services. 
and friends and family so that they know exactly what to expect when they submit a complaint to the BHA and what that process looks like. So we'll be working on that shortly. All right. And then uh, again, that process that uh, of, of care coordination uh, for folks on certifications, that is not going to go into effect until July 2024. So it's a little further down on our priority list, but just know that um, this care coordination function is going to be built out. It will either live within the BHA, so either there will be BHA folks who will serve as care coordinators, uh, or we will contract this service out, uh, perhaps. But either way, there will be a process in place, contact information, and, and all the information and steps available on our website for folks to follow <coughs> whenever a designated facility determines that someone um, on a cert or being discontinued from a cert may need that additional support. So that is coming as well prior to 2024. Right. And then finally, my favorite piece about this bill, which is the uh, 2765 specific training. Uh, this House bill did provide funding for additional FTEs for the BHA so that we can hire folks to develop and implement numerous community trainings uh, specific to different involuntary mental health procedures. So our initial trainings, we're really going to try to target our law enforcement and EMS professionals. Uh, as I mentioned, those EMS folks, this is the first time they've been involved in any of the involuntary treatment procedures. And so we want to make sure we have training available as soon as possible for those folks. And we are working on that actively. Um, we are also tasked with training providers, uh, facilities, counties, judges, magistrates, uh, intervening professionals, and professional persons. Uh, I We also have the vision to create trainings for folks uh, receiving services and their friends and family members, just so that folks can gain a better understanding of this very complicated involuntary treatment process, um, understand fully what their rights are and how to uh, contest treatment, how to submit a grievance, those types of things. So really want to really want to provide some better information for community members and folks receiving services, um, especially from a, a patient rights perspective. So folks are as informed as possible, even before a crisis occurs. It's important information to have. So we are going to be working on all of those trainings. Um, uh, the vision is to have uh, ongoing trainings that just live on the BHA website or in our learning management system. So those will be accessible at any time. We are also hoping to provide periodic, maybe quarterly uh, live or web-based web trainings um, on various topics, including uh, kind of the definition of grave disability, perhaps seclusion and restraint best practices, uh, again, patient rights, um, all sorts of things related to providing um, quality and ethical uh, treatment involuntarily to folks. So those are coming soon. All right. I know that is a whole lot of information and really appreciate you all sitting through this. Um, again, I want to say again, this is this is an overview of the provisions of House Bill 22-1256. There is a lot more information and a lot more detail available in the bill itself, as well as um, already um, in the statutory, um, on the statutory website. So take a look again, familiarize yourself with the bill, especially if you are a 2765 designated provider, um, make sure you're familiar with all the provisions of this bill. And then all of your policies and procedures have been updated to reflect, uh, some of these changes prior to the implementation date. Um, hopefully this presentation is helpful. Again, I know it's a lot of information at once, uh, but please feel free to reach out to the BHA if you have follow-up questions. Um, the individual taking questions from this point forward will be Amy Hickson. She is the Director of Licensing and Designation for the BHA, and she will be happy to answer any questions you might have, or she'll connect you with someone who can better answer your questions. So we'll make sure um, to have folks available if, if anything arises. Uh, again, all of these pieces that I discussed today, as soon as they're available, the M forms, the crisis evaluation form, um, all of these pieces will be available on the BHA website as soon as they come out. Uh, we will be notifying 
um, all of our licensed and designated facilities um, as these as these trainings come out and these M forms. Um, but uh, community members who aren't perhaps designated or licensed by the BHA should just keep their eye on our website um, for those items and they'll be posted just as soon as they're available. So thank you so much again for being here today. I very much appreciate it. And thank you for all you do to provide incredible care to Coloradans experiencing behavioral health crises. Uh, it's a very, very challenging time in folks' lives. It's very important that patient rights are front and center. And I think that's what this uh, House bill did is really uh, centered those patient rights so that we can provide uh, more ethical and better care for folks who are uh, going through this. So very much appreciate all your efforts to that end. And please let us know if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.